Okay, guys, we are going to get started. Um, I'm Jen Adams. I'm the assessment coordinator here at district office, and we are going to run through the COGAT test, cognitive abilities test, just the basics about what it is, the different batteries within it, and then we're going to talk about scoring um, and the process that we go through for that as well. So at your tables, you will have three documents. They're linked in the presentation, but I wanted you to have a hard copy because sometimes it's a little bit difficult to see. So the COGAT. The COGAT is a, a set, an assessment that measures learned reasoning skills in three different areas. We're looking at verbal reasoning, we're looking at quantitative reasoning, and nonverbal reasoning. Um, the questions on our test have students demonstrate their reasoning abilities in each of these areas because these three reasoning areas are the most connected to um, how well they do in school. So the first test you'd give is the verbal battery. We are looking at search and retrieval. Um, some examples are sentence completion or verbal analogies. Um, those are the types of batteries that come, or the subtests that come within the verbal battery. Then you'll move into the quantitative battery. This is um, patterns, relationships like functions, um, having a bunch of different numbers and symbols and having to determine um, what the solution would be when given four different options for um, answers. And then last is the nonverbal. The nonverbal section is looking at spatial reasoning. So there's a subtest called paper folding where the paper's all folded up and they punch a hole in it. And then if you open up the paper, where would the holes be? Um, and the students have to select which, which answer is most appropriate. That one, I think, ends up being the most difficult um, for all of the non-spatial learners, me included. That one is, you sit there and you're looking at the test. Okay, each battery, so verbal, nonverbal, quantitative, has three subtests within it. Each subtest is 10 minutes. They're all timed. Um, we take one battery per day. So you'll give the verbal on one day, then you'll give the quantitative the next day, and then the nonverbal the following day, if schedule follows that. Um, all of the questions are multiple choice. So if you think about it, you're talking about a 30-minute test, but you also need a little bit of time at the beginning and at the end to pass out the materials and collect the materials. So the suggestion is about 45 minutes of time within your schedule allotted for each battery. Okay, the questions in the subtest are focusing on how students are using their reasoning skills. Now these are skills that aren't explicitly taught in the classroom. So um, oftentimes you'll get questions, how can I prepare for the COGAT or what are you doing with my student um, to help make sure they do well on the COGAT. But the COGAT and what we teach in school, they don't parallel. So we say, based on how we're teaching in school, your child should do well on the COGAT because they're taking the skills that we've taught them and they're applying it in a different way. Okay, so our ALFs are helping out with our process just being involved, seeing the test, um, and then they're gonna be also helping on the reporting end as well. Um, all the testing schedules for accommodations are being covered by the assistant principals. We've been in contact about which accommodations need to be followed and then which ones are not permitted based on COGAT's protocols. Um, and then also remembering that this is a secure test. Um, we have to make sure the materials are secure, like a check-in, check-out process, because we can't just have the testing materials like laying on our desk when we leave for the day. It's, um, it's a secure test. So those uh, protocols will be determined by the building. Okay, and this is just a brief uh, IEP portion, so we don't need to make any amendments to IEPs that's very nice for us. Um, all of our accommodations are the same as district-wide. So whatever we would do for math, we would also do for COGAT. Um, the only thing that students cannot use is a calculator. So even if their IEP indicates calculator, COGAT protocol says they are not allowed to use a calculator 
um, that's, the, that's the only biggie. And our EL population, the way the test was designed was really to be available to all learners. So our EL students would be able to participate in the testing. There's not heavy reading that's involved. Um, and then again, any type of accommodations we'd make on a district level assessment for EL students, we would be allowed to make for COGAT as well. Okay, so materials will be coming soon. I'm putting them together next week. Hopefully by the end of next week, materials will be at your buildings. You will have your um, test administrator manual. There will be a booklet for each student plus an answer document for each student. Um, you will need some sort of timing device like you would for park or any other um, timed assessment that we give. And then kids will have their pencils. Um, the only thing you will need is scratch paper when they're taking the quantitative battery because they're allowed to use that. Um, students are not supposed to write in the testing booklets because we reuse those booklets every year. Okay, then after testing is all said and done, we send the tests out to be scored to a scoring company. It takes them about two weeks to get the materials, score the tests, and give us the scores back. Um, then once we receive the scores here at district office, we will have a copy printed out for teachers to have, um, so you have a reference point, and then we will have a copy that goes home to parents with a letter that I write along with it. So you guys will have all the scores before the scores go home. And now on your tables, you'll see an actual profile narrative. This is the report that parents receive along with my letter. It's very comprehensive. It's a little overwhelming when you're looking at it if you don't quite understand what you're looking at. So we're going to walk through a couple different areas of the report so you know what you're looking at and you know what you can reference if a parent calls and asks any questions. So the first part is in the top left corner. This is the actual um, age scores that the parents see and receive. This area gives you the ability scores in standard age scores, plus their stay nine, plus their age percentile rank in all three batteries, and then it gives a composite score as well. So as a reminder, when we are thinking about our criteria for advanced placement, students need to receive a standard age score of a 121 in the verbal area. So it has to be 121 or higher. That's just part of the process. So that's pretty much the first place people look when they receive their report. Okay. The next area that I think is pretty important is this middle section on the right. It's a profile of the test score. And basically what this area is telling us is a brief overview of students' um, relative strengths and relative weaknesses in the particular batteries. And then it also gives some recommended goals for instruction. So this is your quick reference. If you do receive a phone call, um, what are you doing for my child based on how they did on COGAT? Well, here you have some COGAT goals for instruction. So you can glance at that and, and see where you want to take it. So this is a nice place to uh, reference if you get any phone calls. Okay, now you can't see this. At the very bottom, it's okay, I can talk through it. At the very bottom, COGAT comes up with an ability profile. It's fairly unique. It has some numbers, it has some letters, it has pluses, it has minuses. These particular um, profiles are then linked in a larger document. So parents would go to COGAT.com and they would type in the information, that little profile number and letter combination into this drop down box and then it'll print them out it'll give them a PDF a two page document that's an in-depth ability profile so the numbers and the letters actually do mean something there are I think it's a through F for the amount of letter profiles that a student can have the number corresponds to their stay nine 
the first section that has a plus to it is whatever their strength is, whatever area, and then their weaker area. So if you look at this page, it's a two-sided page that I also provided you. This is an example of a selected ability profile. So it's the full profile that parents can access and print out. So it'll give a brief profile explanation. It'll talk about what typical characteristics are of students with this exact profile. It goes into some instructional suggestions for this specific profile. And then it gives general instructional suggestions for students that are within this stay nine or this group of stay nines. So it's usually seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, and four, five, six that they group them together by those stay nines. So it's a lot of information. Um, when you read through this profile, some of it you'll see would make a lot of sense to educators and not so much sense to maybe some parents. So um, just keeping in mind that this is what they're going to be reading and they might, um, there might be some heightened thoughts or feelings. So bear that in mind. And then in the presentation and as you have, I have a full profile. The other document you have is the frequently asked questions. I put this together, it's front and back on the paper copy. I also have it posted on the website in the COGAT area. So um, if you do get questions and you wanna direct parents there, please feel free. Um, you can also, if you wanna send it to them, um, I'm gonna make the presentation available so you have access to the links as well. So the, the FAQ talks about like age percentile rank and national percentile rank and the difference between a standard age score and, and all the pieces of the puzzle. Okay, so we're closing our map window tomorrow and then all of a sudden we have this very quick turnaround and we have the COGAT window opening on February 6th. So the plan is for all buildings to administer COGAT within the first week of the window so that the second week can be reserved for makeups because inevitably we will have some of those. And then the sooner we get done and get the materials back to me, the sooner I can get them out to COGAT and we can turn around and get scores. So most of those schedules have been set by this time or within the next week or so. Okay, that is the end of that. So um, are there any questions, comments, concerns, or anything that you're thinking of that um, you would like to ask or maybe has come up or happened last year that we wanna walk through? I have a student who is um, a newcomer, mm -hmm. and so will he not take the test? I mean, like, he, you said it's for all the L. I don't know mm -hmm. if they have a Spanish version or so I think that that would be a decision that you would be making at the building with your building leaders and really, did they take MAP? Right, but do they have a Spanish version of the test? Right, so they don't. Okay, okay. Right, so I would say no. Okay. okay. Other questions? Okay, that was really fast. Um, all right, well, then that concludes <laughs> our Kogai presentation.